name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I am always hearing, I heard a, 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 I heard a show the other day, it was kind of one of those things in the background, and they were talking about heroes and those who are, are people to look up to, etc. And I was a little surprised at what caught my attention is when I heard some of the names after. I didn't know that the Kardashians apparently are a hero, but apparently to a generation they are. I'm like, you've got to be kidding, are the wives of Beverly Hills, really? are all the nuts that get in trouble that are on TMZ, all the celebrities, and it's over and over, and they're all getting in trouble, and people are just thinking it's just great people to look up to. And I'm like, what happened to all of our heroes? I know that when we were kids, we talked about heroes and real heroes that are out there. I think real heroes like our veterans who have been out there protecting us. Some of our first responders who are out protecting our lives. Teachers who are teaching our children and working so hard are the unknown foster parents who take care of children over and over and over, bringing them and building them to adults so they have productive lives. Those are heroes. But some heroes go even further than that in a list that sometimes will grab your heart. And for me, I do have a few of those heroes in mind. But one of them I want to talk about, and I've mentioned him before, uh, in, in this church because it's just somebody grabs my attention but I'm going to tell the story first before I say his name. It was actually 36 years ago this month and it was a winter day in Washington DC. It was a time that was actually unusually cold in DC for about two weeks when suddenly not only was a, such a huge drop in temperature for so long but then a northeaster the Easter came in to the city. And it actually came in faster than they thought, bringing snow and ice, and ice and snow. If you've ever been to uh, D.C., you'll know that when they, the government lets people off, they do it in stages. They start at 3 o'clock, and they start letting people out because the traffic is so bad, and it's still a disaster. But yet, they do it in stages. Well, this particular day, because the snow and the ice was coming down, the government went ahead and opened, just let everybody go home, which then was just a whole big chaos out on the roads. People were broken down, people had frozen uh, cars, and they were on the side of the road, and people were stuck on bridges, and the ice, as you can imagine, it was just complete chaos all around. But that's not where the story I'm going to go goes. It was a little bit further off the Potomac at Ronald Reagan International Airport. On that particular day, they were all on the flight line doing their normal jobs and de-icing the planes and checking them and making sure everybody was safe. But the storm kept coming in a little harder and harder. And then suddenly there was a delay on the uh, flight line and because of that, more planes sat out there. And even though they went to do the de-icing and they did the check-offs like they normally did, they didn't realize how long the planes had been sitting and how much ice was coming down. So the story, and you're going to remember this, was Air Florida 90. Air Florida 90 got into the taxiway like it normally did every single day, and it went to take off. And as it took off, it went up normal, but then suddenly they realized the weight of the ice on the wings brought it back down until it headed towards the 14th Street Bridge, which had people stuck on as they watched this airplane come straight at them. It actually hits the bridge, killing lots of people on the bridge, and of course, most everybody on the flight, except for six survivors. The, the plane broke open, and they found themselves out in the middle of the Potomac. If you've ever seen the Potomac, you don't want to be out there in the summertime, let alone in the wintertime. As you can imagine, these people who are in warm cabins suddenly are in ice-cold water, snow and ice all the way down the banks, and actually ice in the Potomac itself. And here's where these people were, swimming for their lives. The, the first responders were trying to get there as fast as possible, but of course the streets 95 and 395 and all that are all jammed up because of all the ice and all the traffic. But they got there as fast as they could. People on the bridge were so they shocked there was nowhere for them to go, so they actually started walking down in their clothes on the side of the um, Potomac, but nobody was getting in. Finally, there was a man, according to the report, 
that, uh, from the witnesses and the survivors. A man came up, identified himself uh, very quickly by name, and said, here's what's going to happen. He instructed them exactly what they're going to do and what he was going to do. And he grabbed one and he started to bring him to shore. Once he got to shore, people didn't know what to do and they were asking him and this man started barking orders at the first responders and they listened. They started to kind of come out and cap the water and pull the person to shore. This person turned around and went back out into the Potomac looking for the second survivor and finds and says, here's what's going to happen and gave instructions to the person and said, here's what I'm going to do and pulled them to the side shore telling the first responders, here, this is what you're going to do and they finally pulled the person onto the shore. That wasn't enough. He went back for the third person out in the Potomac. He went out to the fourth person, the fifth person, and even the sixth person, and again, giving instructions to everyone involved. After the sixth person was put on the shore, he went out to find more survivors. But unfortunately for him, he froze, and he went down into the Potomac. His name is Arlen Williams, and the 14th Street Bridge now is named after him. He was a person who ended up not being a, a police department or the fire department, he was actually one of the passengers on the plane. You see, he went and he began to rescue. What he saw was chaos. And in that chaos, he wanted to do something about it. The people on the bank, according to them, and they watched, and even the authorities wondered who this man was. But as he told them and barked orders at them, they listened, and they did exactly what he said. You see, what Arlen did was he rescued with authority. He rescued with authority. He took action. He took it in his own hands. And he told people what they were going to do and they followed. And because he did that, he was a human bridge between death and life. In the world of confusion and chaos in that Potomac River that morning, with Arlen's authority... He saved so many people that are alive today. In the gospel reading today, we hear of Jesus taking control. It is Jesus who's coming into Capernaum. And because it's the Sabbath and the tradition of the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue. And there he begins to teach. But he doesn't teach just like the scribes. They say he teaches with authority. Not only in the knowledge that he has, that people are going, who is this guy? But even in their questions, they listen to him. Because he speaks with one of authority. And so you can imagine his disciples sitting there and the listeners listening to him as he's talking about scripture. But then something happens in the story, doesn't it? Not only is he teaching with authority, but suddenly there is a man with an unclean spirit, whatever that's supposed to mean at the time. And this unclean spirit apparently knows who Jesus is. It says, Jesus of Nazareth, what have you to do with us? He is in fear. What are you going to do? Hurt us? He goes, then the, uh, the demon says, I know who you are. And what the demon realized was he knew Jesus' authority also. And it's Jesus who takes that authority and he demands that the demon come out of the man. And as you know, you hear of all the demons, they start to scream and holler, they don't want to leave us, but they sit there and he's pulled out. And Jesus destroys it. You see, what Jesus has done is he's shown that he has authority over Scripture and authority over uh, the world and also over demons themselves. What Jesus was is a bridge to this man between life and death. In Jesus' authority, in a world of confusion and cold and chaos and sin, it is Jesus and his authority that has saved us all on the cross. Jesus saves us, each of us, and he does it with authority. My question to all of you here today, 
If Jesus speaks and acts with authority, and Jesus teaches his disciples to, uh, to speak and act with authority, then shouldn't his church, shouldn't his church be uh, called to speak on behalf of others, to be uh, responsible as well as speak with authority in this world? I mean, they should have to be able to speak in authority over Scripture, teaching people about God. Don't we have the responsibility and the authority to also bring outsiders to know Jesus Christ? Don't we have the responsibility and the authority to bring people who are on the edge of society into the fold? Don't we have the responsibility and authority to stop injustice in this world? And yes, the church should have the authority even over demons themselves. Yes, I said demons. I am not talking about um, demons that are like Hollywood and all that kind of stuff. What I'm talking about are the real serious demons in this world. Evil. Evil is a, a, a demon in this world. There are people in this world that are evil and hurt other people. And it is the responsibility and the authority of the church to stop it. Poverty. Even though Jesus says poverty will always be here, isn't it the responsibility and the authority of the church to stop poverty, even if it's one person at a time? What about hunger? Don't we have the responsibility and the authority to stop hungry by, uh, hunger by feeding people and uh, stacking uh, food pantries and taking care of those who are hungry? How about neglect? And the problem we're having today, it's not just children with abuse and neglect. We're seeing it with our older senior citizens now of being hurt by other people. Don't we have the responsibility and the authority to stop that? Helplessness. People who are in pain, those who are sick, and even the homeless. Last week, I was disgusted as I read in the paper about a woman who was in a wheelchair who froze to death at the dart station. My God, what has happened to us as a community? To allow a woman to freeze to death at a dart station where there's supposed to be people watching. But it happened. Imagine if we as God's children did not just watch people drown at the banks of a river, but instead became a human chain for people, pulling people out of harm and evil's way in this world. And instead giving people, instead of evil or pain, hope and life. Sometimes we may feel helpless. Sometimes we may feel we're the only ones. What can one person possibly do? But I often thought to myself, I wonder if those words went through Arlen Williams' head as he was out in that cold Potomac in the darkness by himself. If it did, it didn't stop him. He saved with authority. And we need to serve as one with authority because we each uh, have each other. We are never alone. We are never alone because A, we follow one that speaks authority, Jesus Christ. And the other is we have each other. And when we have each other, we are the body of Christ. And there, we are never alone but one voice. This weekend, a few minutes ago, and here in about 30 minutes or so, we will be celebrating as a church. This weekend, we celebrate Holy Trinity by the lake. We celebrate uh, the church community as a whole. With this weekend, we celebrate our community here in Rockwall, Heath, uh, Faith, uh, Forney, all over. This weekend we celebrate the great responsibility that Christ has laid down before us. And this weekend we celebrate that we have listened and responded to that call. It is this weekend that we celebrate our authority of the church over the evils and demons of this world. This is what and why we do what we do. Because God himself has called us to do it. 
He has called us to have responsibility and the authority to stop the evil and crime and the demons of this world. And then we must continue to listen to it. We did it last year, and we will continue to do it this year. Identify it, call it by name, and stop it. We will feed the hungry. We will help CASA. We will help the women's shelters. We will help children in need. We will help the gathering. We will help the hungry and the homeless. And we will do it together with authority. During this time of epiphany, let us think about our responsibility, each one of our responsibilities over evil in this world. And let us know in that confusing, dark, cold river, there's work to be done. And we need to do it in this world with authority and one another. Amen.